Hey everyone, I'm Alexis Ruma, and welcome back to this week's holiday edition of Torch Sports. Being the last episode of the semester, we have a lot in store for today. As always, we have Jackson, Zach, Luke, and Colton on Orange Zone, who will be talking about the college football playoffs. Sophie, Luke, and Jay will discuss the NFL and NBA on Rocky Talk. After that, Jordan and Alexi will bring in the holiday spirit with Christmas topics on Pick 6. Brendan will dive into Tennessee's volleyball team, while Caitlin will talk about Jordan Love and the Packers on SportsCast. Hope everyone has a great holiday, and in the meantime, let's head over to Jackson to kick off Orange Zone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a festive Orange Zone. I'm your host, Jackson Shock, alongside Zach Pelfrey, Luca Tal, and Colton Pennington. Let's jump right in. Last weekend, each of the Power Five conferences crowned their 2023 champions. We start in Las Vegas, the Pac-12, its final conference championship game. Oregon, Washington, a rematch they played earlier in the season, and it was not looking good for Oregon early on. Fortunately, they look at this grab, one hand, and they stay in it. 10-point game, now we're back to another 10-point game. Knicks looking for something. He can find the receiver, and he's gonna be able to make it on the field. They weren't sure if this was a touchdown. They had to go to the review, but it is a touchdown. Keeps it a three-point game, but now, Washington, all they need is a first down to isolate their playoff bid and they get it right there they're able to seal it oregon crushed they were looking for their redemption they weren't able to get it washington makes it to the playoff now we head to texas we're in arlington and this game was not very close luke's gonna be happy about this one look at this trick play heisman oh love that they like i said this was pretty pretty easy nothing really special except for texas blowing the doors off of oklahoma state something that we kind of are maybe excited to see for the playoff. We'll hear from Luke later. They win. We've got our second team in the playoff. Where to next? Of course, the SEC. This one did not disappoint. Very close game throughout. Alabama scores this one, and it was close the entire way. These three points would have been huge, but it takes a bounce off the upright. No good. We're gonna see that's gonna bite them because Alabama is able to kneel the clock out. They win by three and they've got a chance depending on the rest of the games. We're gonna see what happens later. Now, this game, I'm not even gonna hype it up. This looks really cool, but it was, it was a blowout. It's Iowa football. They scored zero points. It was Michigan. This was a fun play though. Watch the track down on this punt return. Michigan's gonna catch it at the 10. He's able to squeak all the way past Iowa. Their punter is a Hall of Famer soon to be, but he's not able to get this one but the chase down, watch this. Poacher in motion, just hawks him down. He ran over 100 yards, you've seen this on TikTok, you've seen it on Instagram, amazing play. Iowa, not so much. Michigan, Harbaugh dodges the water like he dodges cheating allegations. They're able to make it to the playoff. Now we've got one spot, Florida State, you think if they win, they can get in. We're gonna find out. Here they come, obviously on their third string quarterback. It may get ugly, and this game certainly was ugly. Field goal, you know it's bad when you get a field goal in the highlights and it's just a typical field goal. They score, the first points of the game came with 10 minutes in the second. Louisville looking for something and this is really their last opportunity. He's sacked and there we go. Buckets of water, they're hyped up, but they're not gonna be hyped up when they find out the playoff news. Now, let's take a look at the college football playoff now that the committee has decided who's in and who's out. And first, like I said, Michigan undefeated. They had that OSU win. They beat Iowa. They're the number one seed. And second, Washington out of the Pac-12. They get the last championship. They're in undefeated conference champion. At three, we have Texas. Not undefeated, but they do have a conference championship and a decisive one at that. Texas is in at three. And what we expected most, you notice no Florida State. They were undefeated conference champion. No Georgia. They were the number one team almost the entire year. They lose to Bama. Bama is in. We have our four-team playoff. So what were your takeaways? Obviously, a big weekend for college football. What were your takeaways? Did the committee do it right? Did the committee do it wrong? What's the Florida State deal? Colton, I know you got a lot to say. Yeah. Um, well, as Stephen Smith would say, um, this is a blasphemous decision by the college football com uh, <laughs> playoff committee. Um, there's no reason why Florida State should not be in the playoff, in my opinion. Um, I know they said that the injury to Jordan Travis was the reason, but, I mean, you, you got to play the games. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, they won the games without him there. I mean, can you imagine if uh, in the NFL, right, Trevor Lawrence just got hurt, right? They're leading the AFC South. They go in, win the N AFC South, and he's hurt. And so the Roger Goodell just says, you know what? We're just going to throw the Houston in there instead of Jacksonville. <laughs> like, everybody would be up, um, up in arms about that, and it would just be – I mean, nobody would agree with that decision. And then going off of it, they talk about, like, the four best teams. Those are the team that's supposed to be in the playoff. 
But the best is like a subjective term. Like how do you, you cannot adequately determine who's the best team. I mean, people thought Georgia was the best team all year. They went in and lost last night. A lot of people thought Oregon was the better team than Washington. They went in and lost. So the only thing you can go off is the results. And Florida State was 12 and 0. They had a conference championship. If you look at common opponents between them and Alabama too, they beat LSU worse than Alabama did. And that's when they were number five in the country at the start of the year. Um, I just think this is an absolutely terrible decision. I think it, I, the only reason they're in there, in my opinion, is because of viewership and because of money. They know Alabama's going to bring in more money than Florida State would. Mich I, it wouldn't have been a good game, but I don't really think that matters. I mean, I, I think Florida State did enough to be in there, and I just think it's a terrible decision that they're not. That's a great point, and we've had our fair share of terrible playoff games, so I understand that they're looking for the, the viewership and the money, but by the same token, why change it if we've had some, some terrible games in the past? Give Florida State a chance. What would you guys think about the committee? Did they do it right? Did they do it wrong? Zach, what do you think? I want to say that they did it right, even though that leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Florida State should have been in because they were 13-0. Same reason last year why TCU was in, because they deserved it. They were 12-0 all, all year. They lost in their conference championship. They should have been in, and they were in. We're kind of in the same situation we were last year. Florida State, I know they probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have put up the fight, but they should have been in. Now, on the contrary to that, it's going to be better football without them. Man. We're going to see Alabama versus Michigan, and that's going to be one heck of a game. Great viewership. A lot of ads gonna be played there. It's just gonna, <laughs> it's gonna be great football, which I think was a huge deciding factor. And then also Jordan Travis being hurt. I know for some reason that's a factor. I don't believe it should be because he got hurt two weeks ago and they played three football games since then. So that factor, that excuse doesn't really make sense to won me. All of those football games too. Yes, exactly. They won all those games, but that excuse doesn't make sense in my opinion. Yeah, seems like we got shared opinion. Luke, yeah, wrap I mean, it up. I'm agreeing with Colton here. I mean, I think. You, you just got to look at their, their record. They did everything a team that, you know, should make the playoff did. They won all their games. They didn't lose any of their games, and they won their conference championship. And, sure, the conference championship game was a little bit ugly, 3 to nothing at halftime. Not the best football, but you can't revoke them of the right of getting in the playoffs when they couldn't have done anything more. You know, it's, I just think it's an unfair decision, to be honest. Well, unfortunately, that decision has been made. We have Alabama and Michigan, the one versus four. What are your guys' predictions? We'll start, we'll head this way. Luke, who do you think is going to win? Alabama, Michigan, it's a big game, Sugar Bowl. Who do you think is going to win? It's going to be a very good game. Both teams are incredibly Bowl, competitive. Sorry. It's the Rose Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. Both, both teams are incredibly competitive. you got Jim Harbaugh back now. He's amped up. He's getting Michigan amped up. Michigan's not one of the top three defenses in the country to match up against you know, Alabama's great offense led by Jalen Milrow. But, I mean, playoff Nick Saban is a different beast. I mean, he during the regular season, you don't want to play him. But in the playoffs, especially when there was question whether his team was even going to make the playoffs, he's going to be a different animal. I, I see it's, it's going to be a close game, but I think Nick Saban and the, the Alabama Crimson Tide are going to take this one. Yep, Colton? Yeah, I'm going to go with Alabama as well. Yeah. I mean, and I 100% agree with you. I think it comes down to coaching. I think Nick Saban, he's going to get his team ready, and he's going to get them going in there, and I think they're going to pull it out. But Michigan, we've talked about that all year. They've been the best team all year, but they have not impressed me, especially offensively. I'm not a huge fan of J.J. McCarthy. I know they have Blake Corum, but their weapons aren't as good as Alabama, in my opinion. And the gap on defense isn't huge. I mean, Alabama has a really good defense as well, and I think they'll be able to stop Michigan's offense more than Michigan's defense will be able to stop Alabama's offense. So I'm going to go with Alabama. And I think one thing that people don't necessarily recognize is the fact that as good as Saban is as coach in coaching in the playoffs, I'd say the Harbaugh is as bad as he is good. I mean, you've seen the two losses. You've seen the TCU loss. That was horrible to Lots watch if you were a exits. Michigan fan. He's as bad as Saban is good. I don't think Michigan can pull it off no matter if they're the one seed or the infinity seed. It doesn't matter. I don't see them winning. I got Alabama as much as it hurts to say. What do you think? Okay. I think Alabama's going to win this game as well. Um, they are the better team, in my opinion. I think that Blake Corum has not been what he was last year, and that J.J. McCarthy is not as good as people are saying he is. I think Nick Saban in the playoffs, like you were saying, Luke, is just a dangerous, dangerous team. It's not going to be a fair game. I think Alabama's going to take this one probably by two scores. Big one. Big one. That's, <laughs> that's going to be a good – I mean, uh, the, on the contrary of Florida State not being in it, this is going to be an, an amazing playoff. <laughs> Let's jump to the other side of the bracket, the three versus the four, Texas, Washington, Another huge one. Who do you think is going to win? We'll start with Zach. We'll go the other way. Well, Luke, I've been waiting to debate this one all week because <laughs> I knew it was coming. Uh, I'm going to have Washington in this one. That Pac-12 championship game, that really just defined what Washington is. That first half, they looked unstoppable when they held Oregon to three points and they went up 20. Um, what's his name? Uh, Dylan, or Dylan Johnson, their running back, he was amazing. 152 yards, the entire rushing yards for that team. Yep. And then Romo, uh, Rome Odunze, Combining for 100, they also had another receiver over 100 yards. Washington right now is looking unstoppable, and if they can keep with that run game, they're going to give Texas a run for their money. 
This could be a close one. I'm really excited. I've got, God, I don't even know who I have. Like, I really, I genuinely think you could flip a coin. Texas has been hot. Washington came into that Pac-12 game like they, like, they, like Oregon owed them money. Like, it was <laughs> bad. But I don't know. I'm going to, I'm not going to pick. I'm gonna, I guess if I had to pick one, I'll pick Washington because they're a higher seed. But genuinely, anybody can win this game. Colton? Yeah, I'm going to go with Texas. I'm, okay. Mm-hmm. I know I didn't pick Texas to make the playoff last week, but <laughs> I, 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 I'm just not high on Washington. I mean, they can continue to win, but it's, all their games are so close. That's got to come back to bite them at some point. I just think it has to. I mean, nine games in a row have been within 10 points. I mean, they, they've got to lose at some point. I just think they have to. And Texas, they have, they have statistically better offensively and defensively. And um, Quinn Ewers last week looked great, 452 yards. Um, we talked about Penix, but I think Ewers is playing really good too. Texas has absolutely blown out two teams in a row in back-to-back weeks, so they're playing really good football at the right time. I'm going to go with the Longhorns. Yeah, Here we go. I, Texas in-house fan, what you got for us? No surprise, I agree with you. I think Texas <laughs> wins this game, but like you're saying, Texas is playing the best football of the season right now for them. And this is, these teams match up really well, though. I mean, you got Washington with Penix and arguably one of the best receiving cores in college football right now against kind of a weak secondary for Texas. That's definitely the struggle where Texas is, you know, hasn't, hasn't really shown great strength is, is in their pass coverage. Um, so I, that might come to bite them, bite them in the butt in this game with, you know, as strong as Washington is kind of combating that. But, I mean, the Texas front seven led by Tamandre Sweat, and, uh, Byron Murphy, and Jalen Ford. I mean, it's, it's such a strong and, and fast front seven that I think they're going to put pressure on Penix. It's going to make it tough for him to get the ball to the receivers. And then, like you said, Ewers is playing great. The offense is playing great. I haven't been super impressed with Washington's defense this year. So I think Texas overpowers them. This one wins by 10. There we go. Well, Washington wins when it matters. They've won five, three out of their last five have been against top 25 opponents. Uh, Texas has played one, and that was their <laughs> conference championship. They're, the people they've beat, or the teams that they've beat by a lot, that have blown about, have been uh, Texas Tech, Iowa State, TCU, BYU. So real contenders there, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Washington has played real opponents this year, and I know the games have been close, but they win when it matters, and that's what matters in the playoffs. Well, either way, we're going to have somebody happy and somebody sad on this <laughs> set. So we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you for watching the first half of Orange Zone, but stay with us because when we return, we're going to have a festive close to our last Orange Zone of the semester. In the meantime, we're going to send it over to this week's Pick 6 with Jordan and Alexi. See you soon. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the last segment of Pick 6. I'm Jordan Smitherman. And I'm Alexi Cowan. We had a little twist to Pick 6 this week. As our Instagram followers, we asked them to make their picks on various Christmas topics instead of the top matchups of the week, and we'll give our input as well. Let's dive right in. So the first one we have is, would you rather watch NBA on Christmas Day or NFL? And for me, I'd rather watch NBA on Christmas Day because it's been around longer, there's more tradition surrounding it, and I leave NFL for Thanksgiving, and then for Christmas Day, I let NBA have its day. What about you? I'd rather have NBA any day. On Christmas, my Warriors always play. I think they play the Nuggets this year um, at Denver, so I'm going to see if we can pull it off. But NBA, any time of year. Okay, next. So we have a little question on which Tennessee quarterback would you rather have at the family or friends Christmas function, Joe Milton or Hendon Hooker? I'm going to have to go with Joe Milton. I think he's going to keep the kids entertained throughout. Like he has that big old arm. He can just play catch with the little kids all day out in the backyard so that the parents don't have to worry about them. I have to disagree. I think Hooker would be just the better all around. I feel like he's a family man, you okay, know? True. He's a family guy. Your parents would love him. The whole family would love him. He'd sit and tell stories about the Alabama win. Joe Milton couldn't do that. True. Okay. Next, this, one, this question is regarding presents and video games. Would you rather get Madden 24 for Christmas or would you rather get NBA 2K? And I'm going to have to go with Madden. I just think it's more fun than 2K. Have I played either of them that much? No, but I still think Madden would be more fun. I would have to say 2K. This year, you know, they're highlighting Kobe, and I've heard that Xbox and PlayStation players can play together. Oh. on this one. Now, I don't play personally, but I have Me a lot either. of friends that swear by NBA 2K. So I'm going to go with that one. Okay, solid. Okay, so next is we have what would you rather have happen in the Vols bowl game? So either a Milton 70-yard bomb or a right 70-yard run. 
I personally am going to have to go with a mill and 70 yard bomb because there's truly nothing better in Tennessee football. Like we've waited all year. We get so excited for Joe Milton when that ball just goes launching in the air. And that's the thing we get most excited about. And that is his strength and his power. So I just think it's like art in motion. Well, I mean, yeah, we've waited all year for that, but it's not going to happen. Okay, good I point. I mean, he's not going to throw it. True. Or nobody's going to catch it. So I'm going to have to go with Jalen Wright's 70 yard run because that actually could happen. And we've given Milton every chance to do it. And he's not proved us yeah. right so far. Wright did it in the Georgia game, first 10 seconds. Did he? See, mm -hmm. it can happen again. That was the most exciting 10 seconds in the game. So I will ever. Okay, so next up is we have what would you rather have as your New Year's wish? Would you rather have the ball hoops go to the Elite Eight for the second time ever? Or would you have the Lady Vols volleyball team winning a natty? I'm going to have to go with the Vol Hoops in the Elite Eight. The hype surrounding this team this season is unreal, the most I've ever seen it. And I think that the next step for this team is to go to the Elite Eight. And the spark that would come around this campus, if they do that, would be amazing. I would love for that to happen too, but I just don't think we have that much of a chance the way our past couple games have been looking. <laughs> But volleyball has not been a national champion. They haven't even, I don't think, hosted a game. This is their first year in forever that we've hosted, and we swept both two teams. So I think as we speak, they're playing number two Texas. So hoping that they get a win yes. for this one and move on to the next round. Go Lady Vols. Okay, so our last question is just going to be a plain Christmas question. Which Christmas movie do you like better, Elf or Home Alone? I'm going to have to go with Elf. I watch it every year. It's such a classic Christmas movie. I could watch it so many times and not get tired of it. And it makes me laugh every single time at the same jokes I've been laughing at for 10 years. Elf is literally a masterpiece. I, people that don't like it, I don't get it. The humor is great. I have to go with Elf too. That wraps up this last segment of Pick 6. We hope you all enjoyed. And now we're going to send it over to Sophie and the Rocky Talk crew. Hey everyone, welcome back to Rocky Talk. I'm your host, Sophie Starkey, alongside Luca Lamory and Jay King. It may be the holiday season for us, but the NFL and NBA are certainly not slowing down by any means. There were some big games with shocking results following the NFL this week. Arguably, the two best teams in the NFC battled it out Sunday. The 49ers and the Eagles went head-to-head -head in a chippy rematch after Philadelphia kicked San Francisco out of going to the Super Bowl last year. The Eagles were favored, favored to lose the game, but lost by a shocking 23 points. Not their best performance. But does it delegitimize the Eagles team from possibly making it to an NFC or Super Bowl championship moving forward? Jay? No, I mean, one loss does not uh, end the season for the Eagles, especially since it was versus the best team in the NFL and the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, they still have the best record in the league last time I checked at 10-2. And, and while I do think the 49ers are the best team in the NFL and are better than the Eagles, this does not mean that the Eagles are not legit contenders. Yeah, to be honest, this was, a, this was a big game that was supposed to be more competitive, and I'm not sure mm -hmm. how the Eagles fell apart so hard. And, mm -hmm. and look, I know the 49ers were favored to win, but I just kind of expected it to be at least a one-score game. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to discredit uh, San Francisco either. They had a great game. Brock Purdy, I mean, 400 yards and four touchdowns. Defense played stellar. But the Eagles just flat out had a bad game. And, you know, I'm just going to say it. I don't even think it was the Eagles' offense as much as it was just bad defense. They were playing without linebackers Zach Cunningham and N'Kobe Dean. And they just suffered because of it. And I'll be, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the defensive backs just looked awful as well. I mean, they had 42 points dropped on them. I, I, I don't know what to tell you there. And the line was also pretty tame. They only got to pretty twice. Look, if we're going to look at this in the large scheme of things, it will, it will affect them. I mean, we can't just sit here and pretend that the Eagles, you know, are, are just going to forget about this. Will it delegitimize them as contenders? Absolutely not. I mean, these guys are just powerhouse. They've been absolute studs all season. Uh, but if we look at the playoffs down the line, hypothetically, if the 49ers show up in the NFC Championship or some round in the playoffs, to be honest with you, we're going to look back at this game and say, wow, they got their asses handed to them. I mean, easily. Does it rule them out of any sort of deep playoff run? Absolutely not. You look at last year's NFC Championship, that game the 49ers got embarrassed. Uh, and after, I mean, there's obviously some factors that went into that. But if those two teams meet each other soon, I, I, I'll tell you, there's going to be this beatdown looming in the shadow. But for the rest of the Eagles season, there's nothing to worry about. I mean, you've got Dallas coming up this Sunday. After that, their schedule is pretty much a breeze. 
Uh, but come playoff time, this is a loss that will be on their mind. Absolutely. Two great teams hope to see a good rematch in the future. Another intense game this week was the Chiefs and the Packers. Personally, not a fun game for me to watch as a Kansas City fan. But Kansas City took on Green Bay at Lambeau Field and lost 19 to 27. Even with some controversial calls that I will not bring up, this was a poor performance by the Chiefs as reigning Super Bowl champs. So are the Chiefs more vulnerable than we thought? And are the Packers a potential threat? Jay. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think the uh, Chiefs have definitely fallen off this year, and it's, it's really been the whole team, especially the offensive weapons, someone like, I don't know, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Uh, but uh, the, it's obviously not Mahomes' fault. Uh, the amount of drops and missed calls that I've seen uh, the Chiefs get is absolutely insane, and also uh, they need Travis Kelsey to get away from Taylor Swift because he, Amen. Has, Amen. he has fallen off ever since they started dating. Um, yeah, th this team is in uh, the decline right now, and they're des desperately missing Tyree Kill. Um, that was just an awful, awful loss for them. But uh, it is not Mahomes' fault. And a as for the Green Bay Packers, I think they're doing better right now. I think Jordan Love is finally getting his footing. But uh, I just don't think they have what it takes to make it to the playoffs. Agreed. Luke? You know, look, I think more than anything, it, it exposed some massive, massive holes in this Chiefs team. I mean... Injuries are playing a big part in the lack of production, and clearly. But, I, however, along with that, I think for the first time in a very, very long time, we're seeing a Kansas City wide receiver core that is just struggling to get open and get receptions. And, look, I'm going to tell you something, and you, you can disagree with me, but I, this team has played a sloppy brand of football this year. Mahomes is on pace to throw 14 interceptions this season, the most of his career. I mean, you could list a lot here. Red zone struggles, drop passes, and, and the big one, in, in my opinion, is the, just the failure to protect, protect, to protect Patrick Mahomes. We had plenty of examples of that on Monday. I mean, you had a, a red zone trip where you get sacked twice, you run the ball up the middle and lose four. Just absolutely, I mean, the red zone struggles are unbelievable. And it, it's just so much more common than you think. I mean, but I, I think we've held the Chiefs underneath this, this limelight and this pedestal for so many years now since Patrick Mahomes rose to fame. And no matter what happens, I mean, we're just going to look at them as this powerhouse, when in reality, I, I think maybe we're seeing a year where they're not going to go 14-3, and three, or they're going to go, you know, 13-4. and four. I think this is a year that's going to be a little hiccup in the train tracks. Um, but, you know, I think they're a lot more vulnerable than the league thinks, especially with these injuries and mistakes, honestly. And, and the Packers, I mean, yeah, not to disrespect the Packers at all here. I mean, Packers and Jordan Love, they played one hell of a game. I mean, they just took down reigning Super Bowl champions. Uh, pat yourself on the back for that one. But I'll, I'll tell you, are they more of a threat? I think so, but not as much as you may think. I mean, yes, this is a big win, but they've also played some really, really bad games this season. For me, at least, I need Jordan Love and the Packers to show that same type of ball they played on Monday for the coming games, and they've got a playoff shot, easily. But I need more evidence that this type of Packers football is here to stay. Some shots fired there, Luke, but I'm, I'm going to stick with Jay on this one. I blame Taylor Swift fully for the responsibility of the Chiefs, that's all I will say. Anyway, switching over to the NBA, they are in the heart of their season right now and currently in a newly added in-season tournament. This tournament was added in hopes of engaging more viewers and pulling some attention towards the league, and it has certainly done so. So what have you liked so far about the tournament? Who are the best players and the most exciting matchups? Jay. Uh, I know this is an unpopular opinion, but something that I've really enjoyed about this tournament is the unique court designs. Uh, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. I don't like the city uniforms. I think they were all very boring. But uh, the courts themselves look really cool. But uh, for the actual basketball that's being played, uh, the format of the tournament was really unique, and I really enjoyed it. It gave it the World Cup style and uh, one of the big four American sports leagues, first time that's happened, and I, I really enjoyed how it worked. Um, with that being said, we are down to the uh, semifinals tonight. Uh, one matchup is the L.A. Lakers and the New Orleans Pelicans, and the other one is the Milwaukee Bucks versus the Indiana Pacers. Now, for the Lakers and the Pelicans, I think I have the Lakers winning. And between the Bucks and the Pacers, I have the Bucks winning. And then in the championship round, between the Bucks and the Lakers, uh, battle of the one seeds, I have the Bucks winning. Uh, they look like the best team in the league right now. Uh, Giannis and Dame are looking great together. Defense may be a little lacking, but I mean, that offense is just ridiculous. And I have the Bucks winning their first ever uh, in season tournament. Luke? Yeah, it was definitely an interesting idea to add to the NBA season. I mean, you know, the increasing of revenue, they're growing the viewership. I mean, all of it. But I guess, you know, what have I loved? I love the change in pace that it brings to the season. Mm -hmm. I, it's like the, the NBA 
has just been in the same groove for a while. And all of a sudden, you've got, you've got new viewers who are just flipping the channels, and all of a sudden, they stop on an NBA game, and, and the court's like neon. It's like neon yellow or neon red. I mean, they're like, you know, they stop and say, you know, what's happening right now? And that's why you've got all this new viewership in. Uh, you've also got 500 grand going to the players on the team that wins, uh, 200 grand going to the runners up. That's motivation for the players. And I, I, I know what you're going to tell me. I know you're going to say, I know you're going to say, you're going to say you've got, you know, players making upwards of $200 million a year. 500K is just like a, a couple of pennies to them. But you've got bench riders who are making a million dollars a year who, I mean, that, that, that's all the motivation for them in the world. That's like half their contract getting added on to their total salary. And so, look, you've got, that's a big bounty to them. So you've got these starters that are going to play hard uh, for their bench riders. You've got motivation for the players. You've got new viewers, more money, and a change in pace. I think it's an all-around win. But uh, best players, I like Tyrese Halliburton easily. He's had an incredible, incredible tournament. 28.5 points per game, four rebounds, 13.5 average assists, assists uh, almost a 50% field goal uh, percentage. I mean, just all around, just a, a, a great tournament. Uh, LeBron, I, I, you know, you can't not mention him. He's having a great tournament as well. DeMontis Sabonis, the big guy in the paint. I just love seeing him just post up, just boom, you know? I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to watch. Uh, we've got the final four coming up. You've got Pacers, Bucks. Jay, I'm agreeing with both your picks here. I like the Bucks, Pacers, Bucks, um, and Pelicans, Lakers. I got to go Lakers here. Uh, that's all I've got. Just overall, a, a, a win for the NBA, I think, in my opinion. For sure. That's all the time we have for this week's edition of Rocky Talk. See you after the break and happy holidays. What's up, everyone, and happy holidays. It's Brendan here, and welcome to a new segment we're going to be calling the Big Orange Bulletin, where we cover Vol sports not named football and basketball. And today we're going to be shedding some light on our Lady Vols volleyball team, who are headed to the Sweet 16 for the first time in 18 years. Where we face off against the number two seed, Texas, to celebrate, we're going to recap this amazing season for the Lady Vols. The Lady Vols started 5-0, five, uh, five and oh, heading into their matchup against the number one ranked Wisconsin. During the match, the Lady Vols found themselves in a hole down two sets to none, but the Lady Vols wouldn't back down and would go on to win the next two sets, sending it to the fifth set. Although they fought hard, they ultimately fell to Wisconsin Badgers. With their first loss, which told the NCAA committee that the Lady Vols are a resilient team that can battle with some of the top volleyball teams in the nation. Some of the keys to the Lady Vols' success is our three Lady Vol leaders. First is graduate student right side hitter from Fairfax, Virginia, Morgan Fingal, who was just named the AVCA Player of the Year. She averages 4.38 kills per set and is honored to be on the 2023 first team All-SEC team. Our second Lady Vol leader is redshirt freshman from Champaign, Illinois, Caroline Kerr, who is not just on the 2023 All-SEC team, she's on the All-Freshman team as well. She ranks fourth nationally and second in the SEC and leads all NCAA freshmen in assists per game with 11.65. And finally, a graduate student from, from Ohio State, outside hitter from Germantown, Maryland, Janae Zamore, who is also 2023 All-SEC, who is ranked eighth in the SEC in kills per set and averages 3.94 points and 3.63 kills. Those three Lady Vols are the glue that keeps the team together, alongside with Erica Lovett, middle blocker Raven Chase, libero Yelanis Torres, middle blocker Kiki Gra Gradberry. Our Lady Vols are 26 and four and plan to head to their sixth national championship. Anyways, me along with the people at Torch Sports wish the Lady Vols good luck and go Lady Vols. But we also would like to wish you a happy holiday. See ya! Hello everyone and welcome back to the Orange Zone. That's Zach, Colton, and Luke. I'm Jackson Shock. It's the holiday season. I put together a little list to Santa. However, instead of Xboxes and shoes, we're going to be asking for players who have entered the transfer portal that we want to come to Tennessee. So let's take a look at our first guy. Who we got? Yeah, this is Juice Wells, wide receiver from South Carolina, the number one wide receiver currently in the portal, uh, the number 14 overall player. Um, he missed the entire 2023 season with a foot injury. But um, in 2022, his first team All-SEC, 68 catches, 928 yards, and six touchdowns. Um, like I said, he missed all of last season, but he was projected to have a huge year. But now, after this year, the South Carolina didn't have, a, didn't have that good of a year. Spencer <laughs> no. Rattler's leaving. He wants a new challenge. Um, right now, it is between us and the fake UT, Texas. Um, so I'm going to ask you, would you rather him come to Tennessee or come to Texas? I mean, I think it would be great to have him here in Tennessee. <laughs> I think he would be a great addition to the program. I think it would, he would fit right in with us. Sounds like there's a but. 
No, yeah, I think you can trade it. Let's move to our second one. Walter Nolan. Talk us through it. Walter Nolan, this dude is a beast. I mean, he's 6'5", 300 pounds. You can see the little Aggies on his shoulder right there. He goes to Texas A&M. He used to go to Texas A&M. Used to, uh, Luce used to go to here. Texas A&M in the transfer portal. He is just a monster. You don't want to see him on the D-line, and I think he would fit right in, just like Juice Wells. I think he would fit right in with our D-line, and I think he would be a great addition for the Vols. Bring him home, Santa. Bring him home. Last, we got Holden Stays. Holden Stays. So he's the Notre Dame tight end. Well, he's one of, the, one of their tight ends. He was very underutilized this year. The dude is 6'4", 240, so a pretty decent sized tight end. But this year, he only racked up for about 175 yards and four touchdowns. So underutilized by the Fighting Irish, but I think he would fit great in, especially with us losing Castles and uh, Jacob Warren. Absolutely. Kind of got a blank space. Well, Santa, if you're listening, please provide at least one of those guys. I feel like that would be <laughs> nice. I feel like we deserve it after kind of our season looking like that. But we've got some good <laughs> things coming. Now, since it's the season of giving, I have a present for you guys. And uh -oh. it's kind of not a nice present. <laughs> uh -oh. I put together a compilation of some of the takes that maybe haven't aged so well. They've aged like Santa's milk, if you will. Mm. Let's take a look. Phillies in that. And not only do I think they're going to win, but I don't think you guys appreciate the Baltimore Orioles as much as I do. So I'd like to go to the second bracket that it's, I made it's hard that to. will really show <laughs> how I feel. Now I've got the O's. Give me this hat. I got them winning it all. I think they're going to do it. But I mean, Texas was primed for an undefeated season if they won this game. But with this loss, I mean, I think it knocks them out. I mean, of the college oh. football playoff altogether. Because, like I said, with the Big 12, I mean, they're not going to have any other big wins to, you know, I mean, come back after this loss. I mean, the only chance they have is if they get to the Big 12 championship against Oklahoma and win. But even then, they already have one loss. And there's so many undefeated teams right now. I mean, you could, I mean we could really see in all five power conferences this year an undefeated team in each of those conferences. And um, I just don't think there's any way Texas um, makes it through at this point. I mean, with that one loss and this game against Oklahoma, and they had it too. I mean, 122 left. They were they were leading. Oklahoma goes in, drives, scores a touchdown with about 15 seconds left, and wins the game. It's just a heartbreaker. And I think this game, like I like I've said multiple times, I think it knocks them out. I think their season's pretty much over. They might get a high bowl game, but that wasn't what they wanted coming into the season. They wanted to make the college football playoff, and I think. I think their chances of that is over. All right. Well, let's go to scary good now. Let's focus on the good sides. Who's got Oklahoma? Talk us through it. Yeah, I mean, to me, Oklahoma's looked like a flawless team so far this season. I mean, they're undefeated. They've had a lot of really good wins, and, I mean, they've proved they can play against the best. I mean, you saw it in the game against Texas. You know, the Red River rivalry, a big matchup. You know, they show up, they show out, and they win the game. And, I mean, they've, they've had a ton of, of success this whole season. Like I mentioned, they're undefeated, and, and I, they've proven they can play against the best teams of the best, and, you know, I think they deserve to be ranked where they are. There we go. Zach? I mean, I've had this game circled on my calendar since October 16th, 2022. <laughs> I've been waiting for this. I want to start my own streak against Alabama. I know Alabama doesn't have the traditional team, and they're a little bit weaker, and I think Tennessee's a little bit weaker. We're not super contenders for the playoffs, but I think we're still contenders for the SEC. With that being said, it's going to be a low-scoring game. I'm taking the balls 23, sorry, 24, 23. There we go. And, uh, you know, Dixie Land of Light <laughs> is a song about Tennessee. Uh, hit it, Sam. <laughs> Maybe if we got full credit. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> full credit. No wow. Um, Look at that. So, what did you guys think of your reactions after? We can, I mean, obviously... Hindsight's 2020, but uh, the Oklahoma, my favorite my favorite was the Oklahoma take. Hey, the I'll Oklahoma what, take was my favorite. I'm happy that's a bad take. <laughs> in that, that, in that moment, they were. In that moment, <laughs> they were. That, but also, while, <laughs> while Colton was just downing Texas, saying they're never going to make anything, you could just see the rage and pain. <laughs> You're just in the face like, yeah, I don't know hey, if that's true. I Texas know if that's did its job. Yeah. They, they proved him wrong. What else? What else do you guys like about it? I liked, I liked your <laughs> Orioles, Orioles all the way through the bracket. That, that's co comedic gold for me right there. <laughs> Still had a successful season, though, but the Rangers killed everybody. So yeah. it wasn't, wasn't just you. you Look at all plug. the teams. You can you know, have the subtle plug. just the way it was. I gotta say mine was. <laughs> I mean, mine was wishful thinking, right? You, you would hope <laughs> it was going to happen, but, you know. I mean, first half looked like you first were going to have the greatest great. pick of yeah. all time. First half, I mean, Put me on game day, right? right. <laughs> I had the greatest pull, and, and then, you know, we did what Tennessee does. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, well, it's been a fun semester. We've had a lot of fun. That's going to wrap it up for week 12 of the Orange Zone. Thank you so much for watching throughout the entire semester. We've had a blast making these. We're really excited for the upcoming year. For Luke, Zach, Colton, and myself, have a very happy holidays. Stay warm, stay safe, and we're going to see you right back here in 2024. Peace. Peace.
Hello everyone and welcome to SportsCast. I'm Caitlin Gill checking in with this week's Green Bay weather forecast. The sun is shining, the snow is glistening, and the Packers just won the Super Bowl. And in the name of Christmas, I thought I'd read you my favorite new Christmas story. Twas the night before the love shove. Let's get into it. Twas the night before the love shove and all through Green Bay, every cheesehead was stirring, awaiting Jordan Love's revenge game on the Chiefs the next day. Their number 10 jerseys were hung up with care in hopes that a 16 yard Love Watson touchdown with a 30% completion probability would soon be thrown through the air. The cheeseheads were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of a fourth and one 33 yard dot to Dobbs danced in their heads. Away to Lambeau, I flew in a flash, clocking in with Jaden's 4.37 40-yard dash. When right before me, six of the most underrated receivers in football and the Packers' next Hall of Fame quarterback I did see. With footwork so clean and that loverly shove, I knew in a moment that must be Jay Love. Now Dobbs, now Wicks, now Watson and Reed. Oh, Heath, oh, Tory, let the love story begin. You know his name now, Andy Reed. Don't make him show you again. Into the red zone, the Packers, they flew with three primetime touchdowns and a Love legacy game, too. Love said not a word. His stats spoke for themselves. A 90.3 QBR rating to hang on the shelf. Merry love miss to all and to all a good night. A love story that will surely last for generations to come. The future is bright, Cheesehead Nation. The Packers are now at 71% odds to make the playoffs. Matt LaFleur remains 16-0 in December play, and the Bucks are Vegas bound. Go Pack, go Bucks, and go Wisconsin. Cheers to another great year of Wisco Ball. What's up, Ball Nation? Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. In the spirit of Christmas, we are doing a special segment for you. A little outro behind-the-scenes tour uh, with myself, and uh, we're going to talk to some of the people on the crew. We'll start in the lobby here. Not much to see. Uh, the TV show that comes in next and, and does an amazing job. Uh, they are here getting ready. Before they go on, they do an excellent job. I don't know who's better, our show or theirs. It's to be determined. I would say ours. Not much here. This is kind of just like the, the, the hallway. Uh, but this is an important room. This is the master control room. This is our director's office, you could say. The mother load of mother loads. I mean, this is just like everything gets stored here. Audio is tested here. Video is tested here. Things get run through for the arena on the jumbotrons here. Very important room. Um, I don't know how any of these buttons work. I'm not really sure. Um, I don't really want to hit any of them. Again, we're kind of like doing this together. You know, I... We're do, I'm doing this tour, you're figuring it out with me, I'm figuring it out with you. So I'd rather not touch anything in here, but you know, there's importance to it. I, how much, I, I'm not sure, but again, you know, we'll figure it out together. We walk this way, and, and there's not much to see here other than offices where our amazing administration works. Not much to see here. You know, let's go into the studio. I think the studio is important for you to see. Because this is where all the behind the scenes work gets done. And the behind the scenes work is extremely important because without the people that work behind the scenes, we couldn't do what we do. Now, nobody's sitting here at the moment, but this is where we run different shots. This is where we test the audio. This is where we talk to the people on air live. We couldn't do what the people behind the camera do. We're so grateful and thankful to them. So without them, we couldn't do. And speaking about new stuff, we have a lot of good stuff coming next semester, new segments including more interviews, more social media stuff, and yours truly, myself, Matthew Dylan Selitsky, don't tell anybody my middle name, will be doing a show, I guess you could say my own show, we're still yet to come up with the name, uh, where I will interact with the fans, you guys will have your own takes, and uh, I'll come up with, you know, different uh, arguments, maybe some people on air. This is my favorite part of the entire studio, and I know it's a little dirty, it's a little, you know, secretive, this is what I do. I just come back here, I take a minute before I go on and I argue with people. Most of the time it's Caitlin Gill about our terrible Packers and Milwaukee sports. I like to come back here and just enjoy the time back here to myself, to write notes, figure out what I'm gonna say, what I'm gonna argue. So a very important space here for me as we get into the studio portion. And look, everybody's kinda just chilling here. Nothing back there. Everyone's showing Jay's enjoying the fire. Jay, let's hey. talk to Jay. What are you doing up here, Jay? I'm uh, warming up my hands right now. Warming it's, up your it's hands. It's kind of cold in here. It is. Normally it's warm Ooh. in here, but it's it's pretty cool today. So a good sign. We got a little Christmas festive circle going on here. 
I'd say. Um, I want to shout out Jordan. Jordan over there. Jordan with big cheese. I'll never stop smiling. So that's Jordan. And I, I don't know what's going on here. This normally doesn't happen. It's almost like they knew I was coming in. This is Alexis and our amazing cast member, Sophie. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't get them. No, well, you know, some days you're amazing, some days you're great. It depends. You know, but for most of the time, it's all good stuff. Why don't you tell me, Alexis, your favorite part about being on the show? My favorite part is getting to work with you, Matt. That's so sweet. It's almost like I told you to say that. Sophie, you're a Chiefs fan, right? I am a you come in fan. here, you get a lot of slack for being a Chiefs fan. I, I do. Tell me about the arguments that go on here, how you handle some of the, the, the accusations that get thrown in the Chiefs' direction. Well, specifically today, Luke was firing some shots at me, but he's a Steelers fan, so we all Ooh. know he can't really be talking that Very much true. slap. Go Steelers. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> not a part of this. You really just got to show them just the facts. I mean, Super right. Bowl, two-time champs, uh, you really can't argue they're one of the best, but you just got to take it on the chin and show them what's up. Right, Every time. right. Okay, well, you know what, let's go back out the same way we came. Let's get a little look over here real quick. So, just do a little pan around. This is where we shoot our on-desk stuff. Behind there is where we do uh, all of our uh, uh, camera work. Not only camera work, but this is where we do our scripts work. So, when we have a teleprompter running, that's where we control it. And, uh, you know, stand-ups go here, white wall goes there. We're going to go back out this way. And, uh, you know, I said this before, and it's really important. All the people that are on air, we can't do what we do without our amazing crew and our amazing cast. And I, I say it all the time, how important it is to have such an amazing crew that works tirelessly. Uh, for example, Aaron McKay, who's like our, our, our show mom, brought in Christmas hats for everybody. Uh, uh, Fulton, who's behind the camera right now. Fulton, you can wave. Uh, that's our producer. I, I have a list of here of people I would like to thank because they do an excellent job and without them we can't do what we do and everybody at the end of the day is just here for the experience but it's really become more of a family since day one we meet multiple times a week and without everybody both on air and off air we can't do without them i want to acknowledge people off air our camera operator carmen rivera keith bradley our studio manager uh, holland hines our technical director sam hastings our audio engineer i just mentioned fulton myrick who is our amazing producer we love him especially when he smiles and the beard looks good aaron mckay our assistant director and our show mom uh, maya teal our assistant studio manager she's not with us today but we will see her at next semester and of course most importantly clint elmore our director without him none of this would be possible he is the jokester of the entire show Nobody makes more jokes than him. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap this thing up. Uh, we're gonna go into the studio here and uh, get ready. Oh, look, they're all lined up for some reason. I don't have anything to do with that, I swear. But, uh, you know, now it's all empty, but it's okay. You know, everybody gets lined up. Oh, look how cute everybody looks, all lined up behind the fire. Oh, oh, oh.